Welcome to another Tread Talk. This episode is with Coach Bob Larson. You may not know him by name, but you've definitely seen his work with Meb and other Olympians that came out of UCLA. You can learn more about Coach Larson from the documentary City Slickers Can't Stay With Me and the book Running to the Edge, both available on Amazon. Now, let's sit down with legendary running coach Bob Larson. Thank you for sitting down with me. Um, Coach has talked about you for years, and of course, uh, you're known for coaching Meb, and you spent 20 years at UCLA. 21. 21 years at UCLA, and you created successful programs about wherever you went. Um, So you developed a philosophy of running to the edge. Is that your term, or is that Matthew Futterman's term? Matt Futterman really uh, came up with running to the edge. So would you say your your philosophy was running far, (laughs) fast? (laughs) It was early on I learned that threshold training Mm -hmm. was very effective, more maybe effective than anything else. Once you got your base training in, your aerobic training in, Mm -hmm. the next step is to get the faster running in. We were doing this on the roads. And uh, we learned that by running hard on the roads, but uh, at that threshold level, um, and we could maintain it further and further, we had a real advantage over teams that were not using it to that extent. Um, Before we start, uh, I think we need to do some uh, warm-up drills. (laughs) So Meb is famous for being very consistent with his warm-ups, with his drills, and all those sorts of things. So before we talk to you, and a legend of training cross-country runners and marathoners and track and field athletes, I'm going to ask you some beginner questions. So these are going to be called quick feet questions. Uh, So you just answer them with one word or as few words as possible. You ready? Ready. Okay. What shoes should I buy? Comfortable ones. Why does my leg hurt right here? You're probably not stretching enough and strengthening enough. What watch should I get? One that you can read easily when you're running. And how do I get my bowels moving before I run? Coffee and stretching and a little bit of movement. How do I get faster? Practice your mechanics. Are you running this weekend? Yes. How do you carry your phone when you run? I don't carry my phone when I run. Okay. Uh, Best running movie? City Slickers Can't Stay With Me. Okay. What's your best 5K? Personally. Can't remember. Doesn't running hurt your knees? No. Best book on running? Running to the Edge. What do you eat before you race? Something bland. Um, Why don't they just sprint the whole time? Even expenditure of energy. And since you run so much, you just eat whatever you want? When you're younger. Okay. That was good quick feet. Not everybody can uh, manage to go from one to the next like that. Also, I wanted you to respond to a quote because I thought it fit in really well with um, your story of um, journey of coaching and finding guys to to get to their best. So this is a, a quote from Phil Beckner. He's the NBA director of player development. His quote is, So many younger coaches want to solidify their reputation by working with the best. One of the greatest ways to really show if you can make someone better is to take on the rookies, the rejects, the renegades, and help those dudes figure it out. I agree completely. I took a job in a high school that only won one cross-country and one track meet for the previous two years. And I could have gone downtown San Diego and been in a major, large high school. But it was one of the best things I ever did. And that was Monte Vista? Correct. And so there was a program there, but it 
was underserved, to say it. Underdeveloped. Underdeveloped. Um, now, to be fair, the uh, school was fairly new. They were struggling to get sports going, and we won the championship all four years I was there in cross country, and we almost won the championship in track. We were second. State uh, championship or district? It's a CIF. There was no state meet in those years. But even though we were the smallest school in that league, and it was, the league was known for sports, mm -hmm. especially distance running, uh, we were able to dominate by our second year. Our first year, we lost to some of the big schools, but we still won the small schools division mm -hmm. of the CIF San Diego County section. Second year, we asked to go large schools, even though we were small schools because we were beating everybody. We never lost after the first year. Um, the conversation that we're about to have is going to make a lot more <clears throat> sense if you read Running to the Edge by Matthew Futterman and also the documentary City Slickers Can't Catch Me Stay. and Can't Stay With Me. Um, and that's available on Amazon. It was in theaters for a little while in select theaters when it first came out. It's on Amazon right now, Amazon Prime. It's free. That's how I watched it. <laughs> um, now, you do have a resume of underdogs. You mentioned uh, Monte Vista, um, Grossmont, and I think part of the underdog story there is you had a lot of recruiting restrictions. Um, the Hamul, Hamul Toads, you had no sponsor, and it was also local guys that trained together. You didn't bring in ringers from Colorado or, or anywhere else. Um, Ed Mendoza was a bit of an underdog because he had splintery legs. And even Meb at times was a bit of an underdog as a beginner. He was overlooked when um, it was Bob Kennedy was going for the American record in the 10K. And then also when he had a dip in his career, he became an underdog once again. Um, you agree with that summation of your you're an underdog. Yes. Grossman had had some success, and I, uh, Ron Vavrid, um, who was coaching there, had talked me into coming over to um, Grossmont College to work with him rather than going. I had four-year school offers and intended to go back to four-year, but um, uh, he was very influential, and I'm glad I worked with he and Jack Mash and uh, an older gentleman who coached the throws. And I did all the jumps, and um, it was a great experience, wonderful experience. And I think that's one of the signs of a good coach at, at any sport is that you learn all the different disciplines, and track and field especially. You can come in as a distance coach, but then you learn to how to do a seven-point discus throw or whatever the, <laughs> the stances are, and you learn how to do the Fosbury uh, for the kids' sake. Um, before we go, uh, I did want you to to rehash the the Hamul Toads. Um, there is one story in particular about going to visit the course the day before. And I don't know if this was the year that you won uh, the national championship or if it was a different year. But you visited the course even though it was a torrential downpour. <laughs> and what happened is that the the guys on your team came the next day and everyone else was down in the mouth about how awful the course was and how wet it was and how muddy it was. But comparatively, the the Toads thought, this is great. <laughs> Yesterday was way worse. And that, so they kind of had a, a bit of a mental boost or an easier mental time of, of the race. Do you want to tell more about that race day? It was actually UCLA. When I went to UCLA, they'd never been to the cross-country nationals. We made it our first year. Our second year, we had to finish top three in our region, um, and Oregon and Washington State used to dominate. We finished third to them, but we beat the Arizonas and some of the other teams that were rated higher than we were. So the next year, uh, I believe it was the next year or the year after, we won both the next two years, the conference, the regional, top five in the nationals, only were beaten by the teams that were dominated by older foreign athletes. Mm -hmm. But, yes, we went on the course. Got there late and it was already dark, you know, and it's November and uh, cold. It was on the Stanford uh, golf course. And um, we went out there and we went over the course, 
coming down the hill, they slipped and, and sl- slid on their backs, not on purpose. They just couldn't keep their feet. It was that wet and soft. Next day, um, the sun was shining, but the course was very, very soft, the golf course. When they came down the hill in the race, two of them went down on their backs again and slid down and didn't panic because it happened the night before. They actually passed a couple guys going down the hill on their backs, the other guys that were running. It was a hilarious moment, but, if, you know, they knew it was their day. And mm-hmm. I, 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 either that year or the next year, we went one, two, four in the conference in cross country. And our winner was a miler. And... Um, our top runner ended up fourth because he was sick a little bit. So we were very fortunate those two years, and mm-hmm. part of it was getting to know the course beforehand. And uh, that, that's a fun story. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, part of the underdog story is getting sponsors, keeping sponsors, and being able to, to do the things that you need to do as a coach and as a, as a team. Um, Nike seemed to have left some runners out in the cold before, and I don't know if that was just the nature of the business or if that's just bound to happen with such a large company that somebody's eventually going to get their feelings hurt. Um, what was your experience with getting sponsors and, and, and Nike? Nike was our first uh, sponsor, actually, along with the New York uh, Running Club because um, I talked to John Capriotti in uh, – Sydney during the Olympic Games and said we're putting together a club it'll include Dina, Meb, others. Uh, would you like to get in on the ground floor and sponsor it? He said no, that they wanted a clean uniform. They didn't want other things on the uniform. And uh, so uh, we waited several months, talked to him again, and he said, you know, our company is all about starting with distance runners and we should be doing this thing. So I have to give credit to John because she said, okay, we'll step up. Not a lot of money, uh, nothing like uh, maybe they were giving to the farm team in those days, but we were grateful, and uh, it helped us uh, get established up here at Mammoth. Um, There was a disagreement when Meb was getting a little bit older, and I took my time to point out to them that – he should be resigned. He should, he should finish his career with Nike because he's been with Nike. He's been one of the most dedicated, devoted athletes they ever had. Every place he ever won, he had Nike on, and everything would be pressed and neat. And you know, he just presents even in a workout in Mammoth where maybe nobody was going to see him. He looked like a Nike athlete, and I said that's invaluable to your company. And um, uh, Anyway, uh, the connection wasn't made. He felt he didn't get return telephone calls. And he felt a little bit um, uh, undervalued because of it. he was getting older. Um, but uh, so moved on. Uh, Howie, his agent, who's got his law degree from UCLA, one of his younger brothers, um, other companies were interested, including Skechers. And Skechers st- stepped up. And it was it was a great time for Skechers and for Meb, uh, but Nike puts an awful lot of resources into the sport. Are they uh, too heavy-handed sometimes? Um, when you're that big, um, you probably don't cover everything perfectly. Right. And no one does, and so uh, I have to give them some slack. Mm-hmm. Even though at that moment I was disappointed that the way that turned out. And Meb was very, very disappointed. Yeah. And that was about the time they started rounding the wagons to create their own project for distance running. So they didn't really want to split their resources between Mammoth Project and their own, is that the Oregon Project? Uh, yes. Okay. And uh, that's true. And um, yeah. And and to be fair to them, we never said we were going to be a Nike team. Right. We were... Uh, Dina, all those years, was with uh, ASICs. Mm-hmm. We always gave Nike a shot. Um, you know, we said, you you, you have uh, complete a- a- access to our athletes, but it's not going to be a total 
Nike team, we want them to be able to negotiate their best, not something I'm going to tell them what to wear, what to do. So in spite of that, they, they did support us for a number of years, and we're still grateful for that. And it was just the one disappointment, and maybe timing for them was not quite right. Or right. Um, during your time at UC, uh, UCLA, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you coached several Olympians, including Jackie, Joyne, Jackie Joyner, Kersey, and Flojo, and Atto Bolden. Were those all under your tutelage? I was coaching just the men. The only women I coached was a couple of years cross country. Bobby Kersey was coaching the women. Uh, yes, we won f- uh, NC2A titles, a couple of them. There were four gold medalists on just one of those teams. All and college athletes? They, they had graduated, but four of, off of one team. When we won overwhelmingly in 88 and 87 and 88, we scored over 80 points both years. And uh, the 4x4 um, four four at the end of the meet in Eugene, Oregon, broke three minutes first four by four collegiate team ever to do that. And on that team it included Kevin Young, who who until this year had the uh world record in the intermediates. He was the only athlete to go under forty seven until this year. And um if you want to ask me about the super shoes, I can <laughs> tell you how influential those are on the on the uh on the intermediates. Well, this that's are you talking about the Nike's Vaporfly in current uh, years or something back in the 88? No, what's happening now with okay. the shoes. Vaporflies and another company at least or two has the shoes too and they're very effective. Yeah. But these are great guys both in the men's and women's intermediates. Uh I think they would have gotten the world record anyway, mm-hmm. but they maybe got it a little bit quicker and in a bigger margin than they would have if they didn't have those shoes on. Yeah. That is an advantage. In, it's an advantage in distance running, but it's certainly an advantage in the, in the intermediates. Yeah. But on that relay, uh, too, we had Danny Everett, Steve Lewis. Steve Lewis, as a freshman, ran 43-7 or 8 in the uh, Olympics. And, uh, again, as a freshman, won the gold, and Danny Everett was third. Um, they came back on the relay. I think they set a world record. And then, yes, uh, Otto Bolden was one of our guys mm-hmm. during my time there. We came within a couple points of winning the NC2A that year. Arkansas won it. Um, Otto was controversially, he never jumped in his life, but he was called on a jump in the semifinals, and he would have won that easily. And we le- we lost by less than what his 10 points would have mm-hmm. brought us. But... Um, the uh, yeah, we had many Olympians over the years, including John Godina, who was the best shot putter in the world for a while. He still has a collegiate shot put record. I personally coached Dell Davis in his junior year. He jumped seven seventh a quarter at the NC two A championships, which wow. was tied to, uh, Dwight Stone's American record. So you were doing it all, even at UCLA. It's not that you uh, were hands off. You were hands on in every aspect of the sport well um the first few years uh, jim bush had asked me we took jim and a lot of the coaches to europe um to expose them to what europeans were doing because they were ahead of us a little bit we believed they were going to europe all the time Uh, another coach and i put together a clinic tour this was in the 70s and uh, so jim wanted to hire me when tom telez the the uh Field event coach was leaving for for Houston to take the head job. I turned him down, but three years later, he called and said, "Do the we got an opening? I'd like you to come up and coach the jumping events and the distances, which was I, which I was doing at Grossmont, which I was doing at Monta Vista." And uh, then he he said also. I'm going to retire in a couple of years. Hmm. So I said, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> maybe I better do this because I was going to take a head job somewhere else. And uh, so um, I'm glad I went up there and worked with uh, Jim for a couple of years. And then when I c- took over as head coach, I got other people to do all the other events so I could concentrate on being the head coach. But also then I, I 
coach the distances, but relied totally, almost totally, on walk-ons mm. uh, because you only have 12.6 scholarships at that right. point. So you're not going to cover 21 events. Mm -hmm. So I had a really good throwing coach, Art Venegas, and a really good sprint coach who had never sprinted his life or had never coached his life before, John Smith. So those two guys, to keep them excited about it, I wanted to get the best athletes we possibly could. So we put our scholarships mostly into those events. And then, um, and that paid off because we had a good chance of winning the conference, which we did repeatedly, and, um, and the NC2As with those athletes. Because even when they're young, those athletes can double at that level. A distance runner takes longer to develop him. I did give a scholarship to Meb. Mm -hmm. It's talked about in the documentary because... It's my next question. All right, I'll <laughs> let you going. ask it. <laughs> no, keep going because okay. you almost didn't recruit him because of all these uh, strategies of trying to win conferences with people that can double. And normally if you're running a 10K, you don't double. So, yeah, continue going. Talk about how you recruited Meb. One of the reasons I laid off on giving scholarships to distance runners is many of the head coaches are, especially in the conference in those days, Pac-10 at, at that time, were distance coaches, and they were putting their scholarships into distance. There were a couple schools that maybe took three-fourths of their 12 scholarships and gave it to distance runners, and Arkansas was doing that. So am I going to go out and put money into programs where you're going to have to develop for uh, two years, maybe before you're going to get a point at the NC2As. Our standard for a full scholarship at UCLA in those days, because we were getting so many good people and they were producing so many wonderful results and scoring at the NC2A level, is we expected anybody that got a full scholarship to UCLA would score as a freshman. And a distance runner, pretty hard to do. Right. So when I was recruiting Meb, uh, he was very good. But other people were beating him in high school, especially his junior year, even the start of his senior year. He didn't win the uh, footlocker. He took the lead. I was at the race, but Adam Goucher ran him down and ran away from him at the end. Meb did not have a lot of finishing speed. He didn't have a lot of natural speed. So there's some limitations on what he might be able to do against really tough runners over as early as his freshman and sophomore year. But I'd had you mentioned Ed Mendoza and others who also similarly didn't have a lot of speed, but there's so much you can do when they have a heart and courage, and that's what he had. And just like Ed Mendoza, you know, even though he may get beat at the end, he was going to put everything in mm -hmm. at one point in the race. And when you got a guy like that, there's a lot you can do with him. And so I saw that in Meb, but I thought, okay, when I do the house visit, I'm going to offer him a half. And when I got there, and there's... He's got 10 brothers and sisters, met the mother and father who never got a formal education because they lived in Eritrea when Meb was born. And, um, but when they came to the United States, they insisted that all the kids get an education. And they were working so hard, and they already, he already had two brothers in the University of California system doing really well. They all had good grades. He studied like he runs yeah. all out. And he had really good grades, but he had to really work for it. And so I thought, he's going to be fine at UCLA academically. Um, and I think there's something we can do with him because of his heart, because of the, the determination that family had. So even to this day, I somewhat facetiously say, I didn't give a scholarship to Meb. I gave a scholarship to Meb Keflesky's family. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure glad I did because he scored as a freshman yeah. not a lot of points but in the NC2As with 200 to go he was with everybody and he got out sprinted I think he ended up fifth but you get points mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, he made our decision really look good and obviously we had something special I didn't know we had anyone as special as we really did mm -hmm. but that heart that determination um, unparalleled and He's, he was running till he was 41 or 42. Mm -hmm. And I had all these other great Olympians uh, and other athletes. We still had, as, as of uh, until Kevin's record was broken, from this, that era, counting the women, too, who I didn't coach, but we still had about five world records from that era wow. when I was fortunate to be at UCLA. So, you know, we still have the long jump record with Mike Powell, 
29-4 and a half, beat uh, Carl that day who went 29-2 or whatever. Yeah. Both of them beat uh, Beeman's record, which people thought would never happen. Mm-hmm. Beeman did it at altitude. They did it at sea level. So, uh, yeah, the, the history of that time, the excitement of that time, yeah. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, hardly ever parallels. Um, and uh, so I have great appreciation for the athletes and the coaching staff I had. And um, so I still think back with memories. Thanks for bringing that up because mm-hmm. it's a fun time to reminisce about. Yeah. Um, we'll get back to Meb because uh, I definitely want to talk about him. But you also mentioned <clears throat> running with heart, um, how Ed Mendoza ran, how Meb runs. And that's how Prefontaine would run, too. Um, did you ever have the chance to meet Prefontaine or Bob, Bauer, Bob Bowerman, right? And uh, Bill Bowerman. Bill Bowerman. Sorry, you're Bob. By the way, they gave me way too much credit. Um, Matt um, um, Futterman, when he wrote the book, I didn't think he was doing the book on so much on me. It was centered on he saw the film uh, City Slickers Can't Run With can't stay with me back in Boston when it first was being shown to critics by Robert Lusitano, who did the film. Mm-hmm. And it was being shown to uh, sold out audiences that early on. And Matt saw it and called me and said, Bob, I need Robert Lusitano's number. Gave it to him. Robert told me the next day, he said he's got to do a book on the Mool Toads, Grossmont College, that connection. So he came out to California, put two years off and on into writing this book. He was interviewed those toads, and there's some great stories in there, I think you'd agree. Yeah. And uh, why they ran. Yeah. And why it's still meaningful to them what they did and how it still connects to their life to this day. So, um, but I didn't know this was going to be centered on the coach. So uh, we talked a lot, and then when he showed me the book, I said, this is going to be embarrassing. You've given me way too much credit for influence on the sport. Uh, also, I said, you've kind of simplified a little bit uh, and emphasized a little bit uh, the threshold training. Yes, I, I built programs on that because mm-hmm. we were a little bit ahead of other programs with our threshold mm-hmm. training. We did more of it, a little bit harder. Uh, we were known for that. Eventually, if, you know, word got out. More and more teams right. were doing it. But we beat teams that... A lot of people felt we were equal to or maybe a little bit lesser than, but we could beat them because we were doing that. And then we could time up the uh, the championship races at the end of the year easier because we didn't have to rely on interval training, which is harder to control, until we were later in the season, sometimes almost towards the end with our top athletes. Mm-hmm. You kick that in, and now all of a sudden, boom, and mentally they're just, wow, look at this. I'm going around the track easily, uh, mm-hmm. you know, something they couldn't even do before. So those things were in our favor. And um, so, but when I talked to Matt, probably he got, obviously I get a little excited when I talk about threshold training yeah. because it helped us so much. Well, it was such a difference between what they were doing at the time, because at the time Jim Ryan was the, the big man on campus and he was doing upwards of 30 or 40 repeats rather than doing long threshold runs. So it was more or less a revolutionary idea to be doing long, fast runs rather than repeating over and over. Because like even back to the Flying Fins and, and that era, it was repeats, 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 not threshold runs. Correct. And um, I even went up and watched Igloy with Tabori and the other athletes he was working with when he first came defected from the 56 Olympic Games. Uh, in uh, in uh, Australia, and he was up in Santa Clara Youth Village, and I came up and watched their workouts because I was going to a big meet at Sanford, and um, and then also when they were in L.A. because he was doing interval training twice a day, six days a week, and once on Sunday. Mm. So I was figured he knew more about interval training than anybody, right. and so I just watched what they were doing, and it was very influential. But at the same time. A, Close to that same time, uh, I saw the volume training that they were doing down in Australia and New Zealand and uh, put the two together. And later on, Bill Bowerman said the same thing. He realized that. When I heard Bill Bowerman talk in clinics a couple times, I thought, he's 
really a good coach and really intelligent. Well, when somebody agrees with something you think is already good, (laughs) you feel like they're on to something. But I still Uh say Bill is one of our best coaches. And my thoughts were, because uh, Matt Futterman overstates my influence, go back and look at Bill Bowerman and some of the things he did. You ask about Prefontaine. Mm -hmm. In 72, I was up there as a young uh, coach. Let's see, where was I coaching? I was coaching at Grossmont College. So uh, went to clinic. Every morning they had a clinic before the Olympic trials in Eugene. They would bring the, they would try to bring in the coach that was going to be coaching the favorite athlete that afternoon. If they were available and willing to do it, and they were gracious and a lot of them did it. Bowerman did it. Phil Dellinger uh, also would talk at the clinic. And then I would go to all events because, you know, I was coaching sometimes every event. At one point or other, I coached every event. At, Mm-hmm. And, and I was always interested in all of them, so I'd go to clinics for all of them. So I'd go to all of these things. So uh, Bowerman, who I didn't know if he didn't, I didn't know how he knew I, who I was, but he came up and said, Bob, uh, Bill, meaning Dellinger and I are going to be busy setting up for the, uh, you know, the, the trials, everything we're doing in the, uh, at, the, at the meet. He said, could you go out in time uh, Prefontaine for us? And uh, and so I said, oh, no, I wouldn't be interested in that. I'm going to be busy. <laughs> no, I jumped on that one. Yeah. And a uh, young coach, and here I am out in the field with, uh, with Prefontaine. And uh, uh, it was a, a fun moment. He did three times three lappers and then finished with three times 200, I think, something like that. And then later in the trials, he ran the 5K and beat George Young. And uh, so, and those were the ones where the uh, uh, Olympic trials, they had the T-shirts on, stop pre, yeah. and all that stuff. It was a fun moment. And the crowd is just going nuts, just yeah. going nuts. Yeah. So, uh, great time in track and field. Yeah. Um, now, there is uh, a danger in running distances. There's overtraining, there's injury, mental fatigue, yet Meb seems to be the most successful, longest enduring athletes. What were you doing and what were, was he doing to make that happen? A uh, couple things over the course of his career. Coming up here to uh, high altitude was really helpful. Since we were at altitude, we didn't have to run quite as hard to get the heart rate up, to hit heart rate um, trigger points. We didn't have to um, put in quite as many miles. So I think that was really helpful. And Meb is someone who, if you say stay on soft surfaces, is going to stay on soft surfaces. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even to the extent when we're at UCLA where there's quite a bit of concrete, let's say run down the medium of some of the streets where there's a little bit of grass, the other guys are running, you know, and these are great athletes too, but usually they're, you know, they're not paying attention. They're, They're going to run. On the on the asphalt, you look over and there he's running on the grass. Mm-hmm. Everything you ever said, I said to Mib. I had to be very careful, even at the Olympic Games, going into Athens, down to the starting point. Uh, he's doing stuff that I mentioned that this may work. Some of it I got from Randy Wilbur, who was the our science guy at USO U, US um, uh, Olympic Committee. Um, in uh, Colorado Springs. Very intelligent guy and really takes care of so many different things. But he mentioned a couple things he saw, and I mentioned it to Meb, and here he's doing those things on the bus as we're going to the start with the other athletes. They're not all doing them, but he's doing this thing. And it helped him, I think, at uh, part of it was to absorb more fluid at the beginning of the race in Athens. I think it worked. But it's tricky because we hadn't practiced it, but he was still going to do it. So another reminder, I had to really be careful, you know, about what you say with Meb because he was going to try to do it to the best of his ability. But getting back to, uh, we were talking about extended career. Um, One of the things, give him credit too, but uh, some of those guys, the Hmul Toads, Kirk Pfeffer, 210 in the marathon, uh, in Fukuoka when he was really young training with us at UCLA. He had been with us at Grossmont. Uh, I stayed at Grossmont. He went up to Colorado, then came back and trained with us at UCLA, ran 210. 
Uh, this is when the fastest anybody had run was 2.9 maybe in the marathon on the world level. And he was young doing that. He he probably trained a little bit too hard by himself mm-hmm. when he had to, he had a family then and, and on from there. But when I saw he could run 2.10, he was at f- age 40, he ran this, he uh, won the San Diego Marathon. When he was 50, he was still running very fast in marathons. When he was 18 with us at Grossmont, he ran 217, which was a junior world record that stood for a long, long time. Wow. Ed Mendoza made the Olympic team in 10,000 meters and then ran 210 in the marathon. Also, 21003 in Boston on a hot day. Mm. So the, that was one of the impetuses for us to say we got to put a club together and do this stuff because when we started this in 2000, Americans weren't, for the most part, running under 215. I had a junior at UCLA who was not a marathoner run 213. I think it's the only marathon he ever ran. Mm -hmm. So I knew the potential. Another guy, our miler, ran 215 off of the workouts. So I knew that the possibility of guys going under 210 were there, and Meb had similar ability. So that's why we were excited about setting this up and talking to Joe and, you know, his knowledge and, you know, what he had discovered over the years. And, of course, he was an expert on altitude, too. Right. Because you and, and Joe seem to have really similar philosophies as far as running far fast and having a balanced program. He was more of a, a lab geek than you were. He actually <laughs> did some tests on rats, uh, if I'm remembering his book right. Um, so how are you alike, Joe V. Hill, and how, where do you differ? Well, I... Uh, Going back, I want to give Meb credit because um, I mentioned that uh, some of the top runners in the past, including I mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, a couple of the guys we had earlier, you know, long before Meb, um, and thinking of Joan Bonoy too, in, late in their career. They stretched out the workouts. So Meb, when he turned, before he won Boston, maybe the year he won Boston, um, let me back up even further. Okay. When, after Athens, he had a very short time, he, start, he wanted to run New York. So here's August, here's the 1st of November, uh, 10 weeks, I think which is not really enough, usually, to be able to come back and run. And we thought he should rest for two weeks, which he did. He jogged a little bit, but other than that, he didn't do anything. Or he took some days off, then started up again. I suggested that the traditional workout, even you know, with Joe up here, we were doing, and we had done a lot of this before, two interval workouts a week, mile repeats, Joe's standard workout, and a lot what we did the same thing, maybe mile repeats one day and one case another day. And we'd also have a tempo run, and we'd have a long run in there. That's four out of seven days that are hard days. So I said, you know, Kirk Pfeffer would run two 10-milers in about a seven, eight-day period of time, get one mile repeat workout in there, and, but he was doing high mileage, but he still, off of that, he could run a real good 10K, and he could run 210 in the marathon. I said, if we eliminate that one interval day and we do it just a little bit more threshold, which isn't as hard on your body, I felt, up here especially, that um, he could get what he needed to be ready for New York but not beat himself up. Dina, on the other hand, was excited after getting the bronze. She didn't back off much. Mm-hmm. She kept training. Uh, and it looked fine. She looked great. She looked really strong. When we got back up here to Mammoth, uh, Meb couldn't stay with, Abdi was up here with us, couldn't mm-hmm. stay with Abdi, couldn't stay with Ryan Shea, who we you know, lost a few years later, and a couple other guys. She couldn't stay with him, which was the best thing possible for Meb, coming home with a, with a medal and getting his butt beat. Yeah. Uh, but... We took that one, we eliminated that one interval. I said we could do an inter- 
two intervals every other week if you think you need it, but let's try one interval a week. And so we stayed with that. He almost won New York. He went for the water. Henry Ramallah, who, who dropped out of uh, Athens, he took the lead for a while, got into trouble going up the hill, and saved himself for New York. Meb ran the race, came back. He and Ramallah were way out in front, had it 1-2. That's how they finished. But in the park, close, getting pretty close to the finish line, maybe two miles to go, Ramallah took advantage of Meb's inexperience. Meb went for the water. Ramallah did this up the hill. Meb had to chase him, got out of his... One of the few times I saw him lose his mechanics a little bit, cost him. He reeled him back in a little bit, but didn't catch him, and they went. So he got a second. But now, going forward to where we were talking about what did he do in his career, Mm -hmm. when I talked later uh, before Boston, he decided to to go with a nine-day rotation. So, so now it was going to be two. Uh, easier days and an interval workout, two more easier days and a threshold, two more easier days and a long run. So the three hard uh, efforts, high intensity, are going to be separated by two days where you're not going so fast and you're spread it out over nine days. The reason we can do that is, of course, we weren't in college, so we're not in a, a schedule thing. And He's training by himself or with us, but he's, uh, you know, there were a lot of athletes at that point were calling, Coach, can I come up and train with Meb and you? And mm-hmm. I, I'd check with Meb all the time because some of these guys were home, oh my God, you know, yeah. with ability. And uh, they were already champions and running really fast. And I talked to Meb and he said, no, he said, uh, you know, it didn't work out real well between him and, and Ryan. Ryan is very competitive. And Meb would, would, would go after him sometimes when it was supposed to be an easier day mm-hmm. or in a workout where they're supposed to hit a certain thing. And all of a sudden, Meb usually didn't do that. But with Ryan, he did that. With Abdi, he did that sometimes. Uh, usually never overtrained. But if you have somebody that he's training with that's going to kind of take the bit in their mouth and go, mm-hmm. I mean, they're great athletes and they're competitive, good for the, yeah. you know, but in a training environment over a long period of time, sometimes that can be too much. And Meb was getting older and realized he couldn't do that anymore. So he modified it, went to nine days. Joni had done the same late in her career, and she was still, she's still running now. Mm-hmm. So I think that made a big difference because he run, and it, it, it showed him that it worked because he ran Boston 208.30, and uh, uh, I think that was after he won New York. But, but anyway, it was in there, and it, it gave him a few more years. I think it helped him yeah. to run at a high level. Didn't beat up his body as much, and mentally he's more alert, stuff like that. The other thing is he took care of himself so well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, he said prehab instead of rehab, right? Right. He, uh, he would sit in that stream down here at Mammoth uh, you know, every time or in his bathtub with the cold water to recover. Uh, he would, um, uh, his diet was, because uh, he ran into trouble back in the trials for the 208, he cracked a hip. We didn't know it for a long time. He mm-hmm. lost a, long t- a lot of time, but um, uh, made sure he was getting enough protein. It was easy for him to gain weight. So we had to be careful everything we did as far as any weight training or anything that he would bulk up. You look at him, he's fair, you know, he's not real tall, Mm -hmm. but, you know, he probably weighs what Abdi does, and Abdi must be four inches taller. So Abdi has a better body for a distance runner, longer legs, et cetera. You look at uh, Gerber Selassie, is the same size uh, as Meb is, but he's several pounds lighter. I didn't realize that because Meb, is he 5'5 five, five or 5'6? Five, yeah, yeah, and his never. racing weight, according to Meb's own book, was uh, 121 or 122 as ideal racing weight. It was, but he, it was really hard for him to get to that. Yeah. He, it was hard for him to get under 125. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was dangerous a little bit because, again, when he got one of the things we felt in two, that the trials were in 207, but it was for the 208 Olympic Games. The, uh, marathon where we found out his hip 
had a stress fracture but during the race. But um, found out that when he gets his weight down that low, it was a little bit – he was ready early enough. He wanted to win that thing. The, the trials, not make the team, just make the, but he wanted to win that thing. Mm-hmm. He was in such good shape, but uh, probably held his weight down a little bit too longer. So in the future, he said, all right, let's stay 125 or higher, and you'll still uh, be able, within range, to get down below 125, but only do it in the last few weeks. And then he was very careful with his uh, diet. I'm saying we, but a lot of this stuff, I mean, uh, he would pick up on his own. He didn't need coaching those last few years. I mean, he knew all this stuff inside and out. He knew mm-hmm. himself really well. And throughout my coaching career, I felt like you want to try to teach athletes to be independent because you can't always be with them. And at one point, uh, if they're going to continue in the sport, maybe they need time to run or during the summer, you can't be with them during in there's uh, there's uh, restrictions for college and high school when you can train with them. So you're trying to motivate them to train whether you're there or not. Mm-hmm. Obviously, with Mib had that motivation, and uh, in his later years, it was fun to monitor and be with him uh, mm-hmm. and and do all this stuff. But at the same time, I'm just being supportive because uh, he was, you know, the, one of the best ever at right. following through, being motivated, and taking care of everything. Um. That was part of his underdog story was when he got that stress fracture in his hip that it could have easily been his retirement yeah. uh, because at that point of his career, he could have gotten a coaching job at any college that he wanted to, but he came back and came back better than anybody could have expected because it was after that that he won New York and won Boston was after his, his stress yeah, fracture. Yeah. 209, he won... 209 was a wonderful year when he came back off of that uh, stress fracture where he, I think he ran six races total in the year, and I think he maybe won all six of them, mm-hmm. including, I think, the cross-country nationals again. So and now he's not that, he wasn't that young then, but in his 30s. But, yeah, it was remarkable. Uh, you know, he could have retired. Yeah. He was old enough, by 32, he could have retired, but chose to go on, and, uh, and that's part of a that's part of what made Meb Meb. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly, I was reading uh, somebody's notes, and they were saying, you know you've arrived when you're known by one name. Yeah. Meb. Meb. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned, and I didn't hear you explain <clears throat> it, that during the 2004 Olympic marathon, that Meb made one mistake, and he would have gone from silver to gold. Right. What was that mistake? Well, when he and uh, before the race, I told him to watch out for uh, uh, two people or to keep your eye on two two people. One was Baldini, the Italian, who had run very fast in uh, hot weather. Uh, I noticed he was consistent and uh, he was about a 207 marathoner. And then uh, the other one was Turkid, who was the world record holder, 205. I said, if Turkid has a Turkid day, let him go. Yeah. <laughs> I said, but keep your eye on Baldini because uh, he's proven to be reliable and he doesn't go charging out at the beginning. You know, he, he take, he, he's careful. So when they were coming up the hill, I was at the start for them, got on the truck that took the coaches. Uh, a lot of them went to the finish line. I didn't. I went to 10 mile mark, got off so I could see them there because I thought I could yell something to him. You know, this was during, you know, 9-11 had happened. This is 2004, mm-hmm. and it was 2003, the bombing, wasn't it? So here we are. Uh, uh, well, still security, uh, right. you Everything know, is... here in an area of the world where right. there's a lot of people that are very irritated at everything. Mm-hmm. So they were very uh, worried about security. So they were saying you can't even get out on the course. Well, I got out of the course many days in a row. Mm-hmm. Uh, my roommate was Vin Lanana. He had the middle distance runners. And he was wondering why I was going out on the course because marathoners, long distance runners from the United States, didn't medal in the Olympic Games. And um, he didn't say that, but I knew what everybody was thinking. Yeah. In fact, uh, on the day before the marathon, 
uh, I went to in the Olympic Village uh, to to get a uniform for our guys, and they'd already packed it. You know, the metal uniforms, the ones you oh. get, is a different than what you wear in your race. For the ceremony. So I said, you know, these guys still have the marathon to run. We need, and Meb is not a a medium or you know he's he's small size where's his uniform said everything's packed and you can tell on their faces and everything that why why worry yeah. you know nobody's going to get on that stand even though dina had proven it, that we could do that but it didn't click so uh and again he was going to the starting line 38 fastest and mm-hmm. he'd only run three marathons and so um Anyway, uh, when he's on the stand, if you go back and look at the ceremonies in the big stadium, you know, and, uh, we've got things taped over because we and he's got a drawstring because we put together a couple of, of uniforms so he could be up there, and it still, you know, gave credit to the, the company who had uh, paid money for that yeah. that privilege. But that's how out of left field this thing happened, yeah. and uh, there's some wonderful moments like that that. Uh, I'll tell you one other uh, thing. They they scheduled the uh, trip out of Athens uh, in the middle of the night on the last day. So we were going to run the marathon and get on the plane and go. So uh, runs the marathon. Then they have to go to the uh, closing ceremonies. Um, during the marathon, all the guys on the buses going to the closing ceremonies at the main uh, 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 stadium because the marathon was going to finish in the old stadium, you know, the original right, stadium. Right. So that's across town from where the team was going on the buses. So they didn't have a chance to get out on the course and you couldn't get out anyway because of security for the most part. They're watching on television on a couple of the buses. There must have been a dozen of them mm-hmm. taking the kids to the uh, to the stadium. Again, nobody anticipating one more medal, and they do count the medals, whether people like it or not. Medals are important. Yeah. How much money you get from the uh, USOC and other sources, a lot of it depends how many medals you have. So everyone is impor- very, very important. Not that everybody that participates isn't something special in Olympian, but the medalists, that bumps you up. And, and uh, so it's, it's crucial to everybody that you get one of those medals how many we get he's in when he goes by me at 10 miles he's where i suggested which is right behind the big group of runners Mm -hmm. and he looks better than all those guys in front of him they're going up hills now it's hot you know and and humid and he looks fine and i said meb looks good and he said he put his thumb up or something like that and i said you're perfect and then he kept moving up as guys fall back. Marathon is a race of attrition. Right. So he keeps moving up, moving up, moving up. So he gets with Baldini. Neb, when uh, his their father got them out of Eritrea, and his kid, they went to Milan for about a year and a half before they could get refugee status and get to the United States. He learned Italian. Mm-hmm. He's talking to Baldini in Italian. Uh-huh. So these two guys are running together now. And remember, the Brazilian was out in De Santos, I think it was, who got pushed into the crowd. He was yeah. way out in front. I knew they would catch him, but it would have been better I, I, if he wouldn't have got pushed into the crowd mm-hmm. because Baldini wouldn't have made the move, I don't think, when he did. And uh, because Baldini saw it, but Meb didn't. No, that he knew. Both of them knew it had happened, but I think it created a scene for Baldini, thinking a move at this point would would make make the difference. That maybe he felt he could he could get away from Meb at that point, and he's he was very experienced, and he did the right thing. You got to give him full credit. Yeah. I mean, after all, he got the gold. Yeah. But uh, the the circumstance of if if the Brazilian had and the Brazilian did get third, you know, thankfully, but uh, Baldini and Meb, I think for that it threw Meb off a little bit. Just what had happened there, and he probably wasn't. He's made so many good decisions in races, but again, this this is a race in which no American had medaled uh, in 
20, 28 years. So it was in his mind he had to protect that silver. So a quick decision, he let Baldini go. And, and again, Turkett's behind him, so he, he felt he'd better protect the metal because Turkett right. might catch him too. So uh, he let him go. But afterwards, he realized he's running around the stadium high five and Baldini's on the ground. He didn't realize he, he slapped hands with Baldini, but he didn't realize Baldini couldn't get up. That was a difference, and so just looking at that, plus Meb's 10K time was considerably better than Baldini's. It should have been settled on the track, and my money would have been on Meb, but yeah. we're not complaining, obviously. Right. Good for Baldini, good for his coach. He had an excellent coach. Italians were running great, uh, but that when I say it's a mistake, it was, um, you know, in football you have a chance. You're on the goal line. Uh, you know, and you can discuss it with uh, what you're going to do. Well, mm -hmm. you can't in the marathon. If I was standing there, I'd say, don't let him go. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. risk and reward for the gold. Right. You say, let's do it. And maybe in a second would have done it, you know, in future in his, his career. But he was a little bit cautious when maybe that was the one time he shouldn't have been. Yeah. And, yeah, it was une e due, something, something along those lines in Italian. And you see this guy in an American singlet, uh, looks East African, and he's speaking Italian. So <laughs> that's right. That's truly the Olympics, though, right? Oh, it's yeah. Like... And what I was saying on the guys going to the team, the rest of the team going to the stadium for the closing ceremonies, they see on the monitors on the bus uh, about halfway through the race or before that or whatever, Meb is with down to six people, and Meb's in that group. Mm -hmm. And uh, now they're calling the buses that don't have monitors. So now the buses are rocking. <laughs> so they go to the stadium. Uh, they have to go back to the hotel. They get their stuff together and get on the, on the plane. It's the middle of the night. Meb has to do this, get interviewed. He and I are the only ones left. We get out of the hotel. They bring a, car, or a private car for us to go to the uh, plane. They hold the plane. We go in, and uh, it's dark, except we can check in. We go up the ramp, and I'm starting onto the plane. It's dark on the plane. I know everybody's sleeping. It's been Olympic Games. You know, right. they're, they're dead, and they've been celebrating, you know. So I, I know they're all sleeping. So I start down the aisle. The lights go on, and, and the guys are jumping on the seats. And just cheer, and I, I turn around, grab Meb, and push him out in front of me. Yeah, these are guys that have gotten medals. There's sprinters, quarter milers, uh, field event people that all have medals. Maybe it's not even the first one. You know, they've been to other Olympic games, mm -hmm. and here's Meb with that medal. And that that hit him, you know, where they live. The, you know, this yeah. guy did this thing, and so then we go to Munich and. The plane, get another plane, and, and go off. But what wonderful moments! Yeah, I wish everybody who, you know, puts their heart and soul into something, athletics, especially into distance running, had the opportunity to be there, to see that stuff. I mean, it's, uh, I, you know, I'd wish that on any coach or any athlete who mm -hmm. truly, truly, uh, you know, ha has put everything into this thing. And when you think back. Um, how many days and hours and, and, and years we put in up here to make something like that happen and go through the injuries and all of that stuff. And uh, people who have never seen him train or our other people train, it's in the documentary. You saw the Grossmont guys doing this, the Monta Vista guys, doing the same exact workout that Meb was doing, the threshold where they're just pushing in, you know, it's, but Meb's doing it at, 7,000 feet elevation, right. going a little bit further at a harder pace, but it's the same stuff. Yeah. And uh, for that all to connect and for Robert Lusitana to realize that and put it on the documentary and then Matt Futterman too. Mm -hmm. I try to talk um, uh, Robert Lusitana out of doing the documentary when he came to me and said he'd never done anything like this. And I said, nobody was going to be interested in this stuff. Robert, don't do it. I told yeah. him a couple times, but he proceeded so I reluctantly go, go start going through my stuff in my uh, uh, den, and I had stuff I didn't even know I had. I'm so grateful to him because he put it on film, yeah. stuff that would have just disappeared. And even the Hamul Sto uh, 
uh, toad stuff, Mm -hmm. even some UCLA stuff that UCLA didn't have. And uh, he put it all together, and then, lo and behold, Matt Funnerman even writes a book about these guys so that the Hamol toads live again. You know, -hmm. know, it couldn't have been better. Uh, Last thing I wanted to ask you about is Coach V. Hill. Uh, One of the things that he's really well known for is motivating runners. People will say they'd run through a brick wall for him. He denies that. He says, (laughs) I'm not a master motivator. He says, all I do is let people know that I care about them. What, what have you observed with the, the motivation and the care that V. Hill gave? Well, you have to have a, a special personality. <clears throat> if you're in your pickup truck, windows up, and the air conditioning on, and somebody's running a 10-mile temple run on a hot day, at 7,000 feet elevation, you roll down the window and, you, and he says, pick it up, candy ass, <laughs> and they do. There's a special relationship there. So that uh, ability to, uh, to motivate is more than you really like the guy. Uh, he could come up with the right thoughts at the right time. He could see what the possibilities were for that athlete and that team. Um, And I think that combination of those things uh, and just that bubbly, um, very um, upbeat personality over time, consistently, every day, is what would win people over. Some people would get irritated at him even Dina went off on him one time, <coughs> excuse me, uh, because, you know, when you're running over 100 miles a week, you can get irritated. Yeah. <laughs> and I exaggerate that a little bit, but, but that's part of him. It, it's kind of like that. He, he, that, that he could say something that would kind of get your attention, get you to laugh a little bit, and make those tough times a little bit easier. And uh, it was something I always appreciated about coaches, kind of adopted it, you know, back with those teams myself where you could needle guys a little bit and uh, and make the work a little bit easier, take their mind off of it. And I always got assistant coaches, uh, like at UCLA and before, that were different than me. Our personalities, Joe and I, are a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Even though we believe the same things and maybe approach it a little bit differently, um, the, we worked really well together as I had worked with other coaches in the past because I always appreciated people that said it a little bit differently, were, were approachable by athletes in a little bit different way, and the athlete would maybe hear them when I might be trying to say the same thing, but they might not, and vice versa. And so Joe and I working together, I think, was a real plus. I've always felt two coaches working together. Mm-hmm. Um, you could bounce ideas off each other. And sometimes you just don't see something. Or you're just flat out maybe a little bit wrong, and you're maybe not listening close enough to the athletes, and somebody taps you on the shoulder and said, you know, I think they're right. And Joe was that way, and we had that relationship. And, yeah, he loved physiology. He wasn't a physiologist, but... Uh, he taught physiology, and um, he loved it. He'd get up in the morning and even study it. Late in life, he was still doing that same thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, I felt I'd taken all the science classes, loved the science classes, but I felt I didn't have to know all that. I, I just had to know who to call because yeah. when a study came out, I didn't want to make our people into guinea pigs, whatever level I was coaching at unless I could te- check with somebody and somebody would say, oh, no, that test was like six joggers. You know, it has nothing to do with the guys you're working with. Mm-hmm. And they saved me a lot of going down bad, you know, the wrong roads. But Joe, you know, again, was so attentive to all the stuff on top of things. He was a great resource for, you know, thinking in terms of what, we, what was possible, what we could do. And he could look ahead and, and pretty much predict what um, – Athletes could do, uh, sometimes quicker than I could. Sometimes I I could see it quicker than he could. But having two people, again, see this thing through separate eyes and separate backgrounds, very, very v- valuable. This thing was, um, 
Well, I think Joe, too, expressed how much fun he had up here yeah. doing this thing. Not that Adam State wasn't, you know, just the epitome of so many great things and great people. But up here, one of the things I really enjoyed, too, is he got to be known more by some of the people who didn't know him, other than distance coaches, because of what we put together up here. And uh, it brought more attention to a guy who deserved all the attention right. you prob- could probably get anybody. Because there was a lot of po- things he did for USA Track and Field that you know a lot of people wouldn't even know about. And yeah, because he started the USATF education program. Exactly. And the first Olympic trials in, <laughs> in was it in um, Alamosa that, that they had the first marathon Olympic trials? I think the altitude, maybe that year they had two trials even, but yeah, because they had the Mexico certainly. City was the same as Alamosa. Right. right. Coach, you're famous for the, the, the you're done gesture. <laughs> so if uh, we're done here, we're done here. Thank you for your time. It's been good talking to you. You too. I apologize for the long answers, but... Uh, That's what I'm looking for. Well, okay. Right. I hope it, hope it works for you. Yeah. Thank you.